Good morning, good afternoon, good evening. It's the usual start to Drone Stuff this week. It's not a usual day. It's another Drone Stuff this week special. And this one's brought about by, I should have put a, I should have put a slide up in front of me. I saw this week, um, and I don't know if that's sharing or, or showing on the screen now, I saw this image, and this image is the inside of um, a multi-rotor, and there's an SD card in it, glued to it on the inside, and that piqued my interest. So I reached out to um, David Kovar, who's very sad, and this is why I'm going to get it wrong here, because I think he sat on the right-hand side of the screen as you look at it, but I'm not sure, it could be the left. And then we're also joined by um, David Walters and uh, Kevin, and, and these guys are pretty much security experts in one way or another. Um, David Walters, um, he spoke to me about uh, their product CQNet and just one, last week when we were signing off, he mentioned that they store data on, um, or each, each client has his own server to store their data on and that also piqued my interest because why on earth would you do that? Why wouldn't you just use cloud services? So I thought it'd be nice on a Friday afternoon, just or Friday morning if you're in America, just to have um, a chat out about it. So. I don't know. I have no questions. I've prepared nothing. Um, let's start with David Kovar. David, um, what did that image mean? What was that image all about? So that image is, as you said, from a multi-rotor. And it's essentially the black box. Uh, just like manned aviation has black boxes that, in the event of a crash, they go find that definitive source of data of what happened to this aircraft in the last minutes of flight. Um, that particular USB, uh, that particular SD card represents the black box for a multi-rotor. And most vendors have some form of that. Some vendors make it a little bit easier to extract, some make it more difficult. This is one of the more difficult ones. You've actually got to open the shell up, uh, peel that epoxy back and then pull the card off. But that is a wealth of data that is updated by the aircraft at you know very high rate of frequency, talking about all the things that's going on with the aircraft, um, how it's being controlled, where the gimbal's pointing, where it is in time and space, what the sensors are seeing, all of that sort of stuff. And this is a sort of information that is very used for flight management um, service offerings, but it's also very good from an investigative point of view, either you're doing a crash investigation or you're trying to determine whether this was used for malicious purposes. Um, there are other sources of data which we can get into, but that's the primary one. And I should have said at the, at the top of the show that you are a forensics uh, expert. Would you say a drone forensics or electronics <laughs> forensics expert? I don't, I don't know. And your, your company is Kovar and Associates. Is that right? That's right. So I've been doing digital forensics for over 15 years, uh, specializing in uh, computers, uh, mobile devices, uh, both large and small scale. And approximately three years ago, uh, started looking at UAV or drone forensics and really specialized in that. And I and a couple other people are really sort of defining uh, the UAV forensics practice, um, but it's really built on existing digital forensics um, processes and models and tools that are already out there. And that's one of the things that we try to communicate to law enforcement and to pretty much anybody else is that while UAVs are this brand new bright shiny object, that the ways of accessing the data um, and analyzing it, we all really understand because they're based on existing principles, but also from a cybersecurity perspective, which uh, David will also speak about, um, protecting that data, you can apply existing cybersecurity controls to it as well, and it's not you don't have to go off and learn some new model. You can you can treat it using existing models. And so then, to to use that that dreadful word cyber, that does that mean as what what does that mean in our, this context? Is the way that machines communicate have implications? The ways that machines communicate, uh, the ways that data is stored, the ways that data is communicated, uh, the people that have access to that data, all have implications. And for anybody who's looking into doing investigations or for protecting their UAV related data be it from the aircraft, from the sensor, from how they operate, all that sort of stuff, they need to look at all of these components. They need to look at you know, what data is available, where is it available, who's got access to it, how we're protecting it, are we wiping it when we're done using it, um, if we're storing it for the long term, how are we storing it, do we have data retention policies in place, um, if we're using software as a service, do our service providers have protection models that apply to how we want to protect our data. 
Um, if that service provider is hacked into, are they going to let us know that they got hacked into and what data was taken? Um, if we're sharing data with a, a service provider, where does that data reside? Does it reside in the United States? Does it reside in a generic cloud where we don't know where it is? All of those things need to be considered by anybody who's really interested in the subject. I hadn't thought about that. I hadn't thought about if I use one of the cloud services for map processing that, yeah, if they had an attack, uh, yeah, I, I should probably know. I'd never considered that. Is there, a, is there another industry, uh, you say that the tools you use are, are pretty standard and you use them for other things. Is there a comparable industry uh, that handles lots of data for things that, that you might compare the drone industry to? Well, uh, one of the things to remember about the drone industry is that while the, the, the data repositories and the processors on the drones are somewhat unique, um, they are essentially an instantation of IoT. So you've got CPUs, you've got storage, you've got an onboard network, you've got a connection out either to the cloud or to something else, which looks a lot like a lot of IoT. And so you can start thinking about that model. But one of the things that you need to remember, both from an investigative standpoint and from a cybersecurity protection standpoint, is that it's not just the UAV. It's also the, the mobile device that you're using as a ground control station. There's an enormous amount of data on there that's valuable for you, but it's also valuable for somebody who's trying to attack and get access to your data. There's the uh, data storage that you've got inside your own office where you're doing your pre-flight planning, you're doing your firmware updates, you're doing your billing, you're doing your back-end data processing. So we existing data um, forensics investigative tools and data security models apply for most of those things. Where it gets unique is how do we access the data on board the UAV and how do we process the logs that are on board the UAV and process some of the logs that are produced by those mobile device applications because they're not exactly flat text files with, you know, here's one line, here's another line, here's another line. They're structured in some strange ways that requires at least some new thinking about how to extract and process that data. I want to get to the other David in a, a second. Why would I? Why would I call you though? What? What? What's? What's? Why? Why do we need you? Why do you need me? Um, yeah. Because I'm a very, very charismatic guy. Oh, um, fair no, enough. Yeah, fair play. Yeah. Um, you need people such as myself because we have we we can't, we have our foot in two worlds. We have a very deep understanding of digital forensics. So, what does it take to extract? analyze and report on that data so that if you're doing an internal investigation for human resources or for legal that we can put together a case for you to make a informed decision and know that all of the available data is presented accurately and presented in context so that the average lay person can understand the significance of the data and what that overall story is and also that we can present that data in such a way that it'll stand up in a court of law, whether that's in Australia or Africa and the United States. So we know how to work with law enforcement and make sure that the, everything is analyzed accurately and presented accurately so it'll stand up in those venues. The other thing is we come from a very strong UAV background. So we understand what the data signifies. So if you're looking at the files, there's a bunch of raw numbers in there. And some of those numbers, you know, like, 5421 has something to do with a battery, but what does that have to do with the battery? Well, it turns out there are three values that are all in the 5,000 range, and what it turns out is that that's the battery voltage for each one of the three cells on a particular type of battery, for example. Or you have to understand that the temperature of the battery is represented in tenths of a degree of Kelvin, which is a kind of odd measurement, but until you understand that, you can't put it in an appropriate context. Or you have to understand that you know, UAVs have a return to home feature. And so that is significant for not only what the initial GPS location is, but for why an aircraft did a particular thing when the battery dropped below 30%. So that's drilling down into what an aircraft might have done in its flight and things like that. Who's, gonna, who's calling you for that information? That's what I need help understanding. <laughs> would, 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 I, um, would I, as a company, uh, let's say I'm, I'm, I inspect critical infrastructure. Is there some sort of um, requirement that I have to that I have to um, comply with uh, that my data is stored in this sort of a way? It 
never does this it never does that would you be the man that comes in and says oh yeah because they're using that 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 and that it's compliant oh no you're not quite compliant you need to do this and then you'll comply with the abc um electricity companies requirements for for storing data sorry I'm ran i ranted around that a bit is, is that what you sort of you do that's that's my background my background is doing on doing cyber security audits so do you have the right controls in place and are you complying with the controls you've established and if you're not how do we fix it but what we are now specializing in is providing the data for other people to perform some of those audits so particularly if you are a critical infrastructure owner that's outsourcing your flight operations to another vendor, you would request all of their data from them. And you would, you would have a well-established policy of how you want them to fly, how often, what altitudes, distance away from your power lines and things like that. And we would be able to analyze your, that data and say automatically, essentially, um, that you are in or outside of compliance. And so there's a compliance check capability there. So um, you're, you're making yourself a hyper-focused sort of business then uh, if it's um, – so, so yeah, I must have guessed right then. Critical in infrastructure must be one of your, your key sort of um, customers. And, and so that's what you'll do to them. So in this part 107 world that you're living in America, I think jobs are being outsourced rather than the ABC tel um, electricity company having a, a, a flight branch that handles the whole nation. Um, so you would go to each one of those 107s and say, you know, we find out whether, yeah, whether they're storing. And then I suppose if it's a remote operation, they've also got to be able to transmit that data to HQ in a format that s stays secure and all that sort of thing. Um, I'm moving this yep. conversation all over the place, aren't we? Yeah. <laughs> well, that's just so we're interesting. Also, we're also looking, we're also, we also help with insurance claims. So if, some, if an insurance company has okay. uh, somebody saying that we lost our $30,000 UAV with a $100,000 aircraft uh, camera on it, what really happened um we help with law enforcement investigations um we help we're with a back end for some of the flight management systems so if they need to process log files for doing flight management offerings then we can provide that back in as a software the service um so, if we good so uh, so who audits who audits the auditor uh, we are open to being audited by any our clients if necessary. And one of the things that we intend to do is uh, do a couple of different things. So one is uh, have other companies audit our security controls, audit the design of our environment, um, and do the occasional pack, uh, what we call attack and pen test on our environment to ensure that that data is secure. And if it's not secure or they find certain ways to get into our data, that we, they work with us to ensure that those gaps are closed. And we do this on a rolling basis because you push out a new release and if you fail to do one thing in there and that opens up a vulnerability or you reconfigure some part of your cloud-based infrastructure and that exposes something or you deploy a new environment for somebody, uh, particularly if you're deploying a new environment for law enforcement or the military, you want to make that sure that's absolutely locked down. And in those cases, we'd actually do that security audit and buy a third party and have somebody publish that and make it available to the client before we roll it out live. Okay. There's all sorts of things I hadn't, hadn't considered before we started that. And let's bring on the other David and then we'll jump around with um, questions. So when we spoke about um, CQNet, David, you, you, you mentioned that you were keeping each client at his own server and things like that. Why did you come around to that decision? What on earth was that about? So um, my background initially uh, is IT anyway, and that's originally when my career started. Um, and uh, I've gone through the pains with organizations with security breaches uh, and things like that. And so when I joined the UAS industry, um, you know, and became interested in the systems, the data it's collected, uh, and how it's stored, uh, when we came to develop CQNet, uh, we wanted to deliver an enterprise product. Um, uh, our servers, our, our cloud-based servers, just so there's no confusion, but they are um, secure um, IBM Bluemix servers that we use there. Uh, the systems, the specification that they utilize um, exceeds industry standards. Um, and you have two options when you set up cloud services. You either go for a, a multi-tenant uh, environment, 
or you go for a single tenant environment. And basically the difference is your data is shared in a spreadsheet site table inside a database with loads of other users on that system. So if that database ever got breached because of one user's uh, force of cyber security credentials as it might be, um, then potentially the whole database is accessible. Um, with us being able to set up these single instances uh, with a, a secure database backend that's only assigned to one client, um, it really improves the security and also the redundancy point of view as well. So from an organization, if I have 50 clients sitting in one database and that one server went down, I have 50 clients going offline. Um, so from a strategy point of view, it's probably not best practice. If I suffer with a, a DNS outage or something or a hardware outage, uh, with one particular uh, system, um, it ensures that the client that's been affected, I only lose one for an amount of time as opposed to the remaining operators on the system. Um, and the data that's being collected, it isn't just about uh, the images that are being captured in flight or the video that, the, that the people are capturing. Um, it could be the flight log data. So this is a, a sample of a flight log um, from one, one system. Um, and most flight logs are pretty much the muchness. They record the GPS positioning. Um, as was mentioned earlier by David, um, it mentions the controls that are used within the system. And the reason we give the ability for our clients to upload this data is we use this data to help them enhance and provide a safer operation for their UAS operations. So we take from this, um, the ability to enhance their training so we can see where users are using functions um, that maybe they're not permitted to use or haven't had training with. Uh, we utilize it to populate pilot flying hours, aircraft flying hours, raise issues potentially with hardware um, that might be reported within the airlock itself. Uh, we can see if return to home is being missionized on a mission, um, things like that. So that's why we give the ability to our clients to utilize the flight data because essentially, it is their flight log. It's come from their system that they purchased. Um, uh, they can upload their flight logs to our system in a secure environment. Um, so again, help support their operations um, and help support the number of other areas of the business as well. So that's, that's all well and good. So that's your, your wall garden that you've, you've created. Um, uh, that, that little SD card, let's go back to that little SD card that was bur buried on the board. Um, what what's that there for then? I don't know if anyone wants to. So because we all put a, I'm assuming that where your data is coming from might be from the SD card that people are used to, and they put in the side of the aircraft. And that second SD card that's hidden inside, what's that job in life that's, for? That's, uh, just, that's that's good engineering in a sense when it comes to having that black box, the secondary um, secondary reporting system. Um, obviously, you could use it for many different uses, but as we said here, the main one that we were interested in originally was uh, reconstructing situations. If you had an incident and you wanted to have that information, <clears throat> you're going to have it based on the machine itself, not on the user putting in a secondary SD card to record audio and video. So these systems are designed to have that, as uh, David mentioned earlier, as the black box. And that records all the board telemetry, all the the inputs and the actual code itself, um, other than the, the screen he just showed, which is actually from the DAT file from the onboard system, there's another file in there that actually shows uh, the, the routines and triggers that are sent through the system itself. And those can be traced and then published and you can see exactly um, when things were triggered, turned on, turned off, uh, flight modes, and if they had GPS signal or not, all that would be listed as well. So there's, anywhere between 20 and 30 different sources of information stored on these cards, um, used for many different reasons. Um, it, it's across the board why of, you know, as we're seeing here, this is, this is actually from the DAT file from the system itself that shows um, several different, there's actually a really good source that has um, the explanation for each one of these. Um, DATCON mm -hmm. has a very good, um, read me that has the exact reason for each one of these cells um, you're seeing towards the end of the file where it shows the voltage of the batteries and it's gimbal heading on the left 
And then on the right, it's fly state, which is, was it in GPS lock? Was it in sport mode? Was it in uh, manual mode? And as you can see on the message, those are what's getting pushed through to the actual receiver. Um, that's going to be the message and notifications going to the pilot itself. So this is a, an aggregated gathering of the systems and what messages are being run through the routines. Um, there's individual files that are on that system as well that you have access to, um, including the, the root files showing exact commands, um, the video cache. It All goes right. into a couple other ones with visual services. So if you have sensors, it'll show the actual uh, strength and what was coming in. Um, when, so I, the, um, when I use one system I use, I can see a, a, a file like that is on the little SD card that comes in and out. Uh, along with my uh, photographic images. So that card inside the machine, how do I access that other than unsticking it and look at it? And then if, well, I, don't uh, unst if I don't unstick it and look at it, who else can access it and how can they access it? So, so to there, answer that, that question, there's two different ways to do that. One is um, most of the consumer... Uh, drones that we're talking about here by the major global manufacturers have a, a micro USB port that you can plug into your laptop or your computer and run their own proprietary software to have access to those files. Um, you can actually go through File Explorer and, and jump into those files too. Um, there's a couple different ways that David and David, I should just refer to them as the Davids, um, <laughs> can go into more detail about um, special different programs that can actually jailbreak that and get into it but um just the direct connect from your actual drone to your computer will give you access to them one of the challenges of going that route is that the vendor will often only expose the files that they want you to see and that you don't necessarily have access to all the files um and the other from a forensically sound standpoint is that since the aircraft is running to power up that usb connection and make it available things on that file system could be being changed. So if you're not concerned about forensic sound, forensically sound data collection, going through the USB port using the vendor supplied tools is absolutely the easiest way to go. For most flight management purposes, that's the right solution. Um, if you're trying to do it from a forensically sound standpoint, uh, really the best practice says open it up, pull that epoxy off, uh, extract the card, plug it into a write blocker, and then pull the data off the actual file system. And does the data on that card on board the aircraft, is that ident ident is that, so if I plug in a USB, is that, well, I know it isn't. I know I can get that, that, that file from elsewhere. Um, so does that, is that, that data, does that different to what I might expect on a removable card? Uh, does it, is it persistent? Does it, what, what do we know about what's on that card? <laughs> so there, there are generally two cards. So one card you referred to earlier is actually the card that's actually on the sensor. And so that's got your that's got your videos, that's got your still images. There's forensically sound, there's forensic evidence on there. Uh, each one of the images contains what they call EXIF data, which gives you lat long altitude and uh, some other things. Uh, the data on that SD card on that epoxy um, controls the log files that we are talking about. Um, and the thing to remember is that there's also another set of log files that's on your controller on your mobile device. And so different vendors use different sources of data. The data that's on the mobile device is a little bit richer in some areas, um, but it's less rich in other areas. So depending on what you're looking for, you go for one or the other. But one of the reasons why you wanna be able to get the data off of both of those devices is that, uh, let's just talk about counter UAS, for example, which is you know how you bring down a malicious aircraft or if you find an aircraft. So if all you have is the aircraft, and you don't know how to analyze the data from that epoxied on micro SD card, you don't have any place to start. Um, you don't have that mobile phone to give you the other types of data that you know how to analyze. And from a forensics perspective, from an investigative standpoint, you want to tie all of these things together. You want to be able to, like on your show, in your last show I watched, somebody said, you know, who done it? And the, the answer to the question of who done it is you got to look at the data from that the uh, media card, which has got the pictures on it. You got to look at the data from the SD card, which is epoxied on. You got to look at the data from their ground control station, that mobile device. You got to look at the data from their cloud provider and tie all these things together to say, 
we definitively, we believe with a high degree of probability that this person was holding this mobile device at the time this particular UAV crashed into that building. So there's your whodunit, and it tie, it's, it's done by tying all these sources of information together. Uh, so is there, you, yeah, because you've got the flight controller, you've got the aircraft itself. Is there a particular, is there a serial number that ties it all together, or how, how would you tie it all together? DGI specifically says, I, I apologize, vendors generally say that there's not a specific serial number that ties together all those components. But like everything else out there, like your automobile, for example, each major part of your automobile has a serial number on it. There's a record of when we built this aircraft, here's all the parts that went into it, here's all the serial numbers for each one of those parts. For each one of the UAVs out there, there are serial numbers on most of the major devices. So particularly on the flight controller, there's generally a serial number on there. The serial number that's printed on the flight controller oftentimes ends up on the log that's on board the aircraft. That serial number on board the aircraft oftentimes also ends up on the log file from the mobile device. The mobile device application has its own serial number, application version, and things like that, that also now ends up on that log file. So now in that log file, you've got a serial number from the aircraft, you've got a application ID from the application, both in one log file that's been pushed up to the service provider, so now you've tied together a UAV, a mobile device application, and a time and IP address and other things all in one spot. And you can now start saying these things are related to each other. And that, and as, as long as you had that, so does that go onto that card that's on board the aircraft then all, all those? No, it doesn't. That's, it, you, that's, that's why you got, if, for investigative purposes, you've got to look at everything you've got. So you start with a UAV, and you figure out where it was launched from by using the data on board that card or from looking at the sensor data, which has got EXIF information. And you go to that launch point, it's like, oh, wait, there's still somebody standing here with a controller. So let's look at the controller. Okay, they have a mobile device. Okay, let's pull the logs off that mobile device. Well, that mobile device is using service provider XYZ. Okay, let's file a subpoena against that service provider to see where else they've been flying. You tie, you tie all those bits and pieces together to make that whole story. I see the other David's put up, a, 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 I happen to know what that story is. That's the chap that's just been fined in the UK. They changed how they found him, didn't they, other David? It's not FAA, it's um, Police Direct, I think. I'll let you answer that. You better unmute your microphone. <laughs> there we go. <laughs> So, um, so yeah, I, I actually began following this story um, uh, when we first heard about it to um, offer them the ability to access the flight level data. Uh, and it turns out actually the force have got their own technical forensics now internally um, for investigating these issues. Um, and I believe it was a combination of them uh, catching um, the guy with the kit, uh, but he denied he was flying. So they seized his mobile device, uh, which would have had his flight logs on it. Um, and again, it goes back to, you know, what does that flight log contain? How is it accessible? And in this case, um, they seized uh, his drone, his phone, uh, and then they seized his PC from home, and it kind of went full circle. You know, they, they've captured everything that he'd been doing, um, and he's been prosecuted for uh, a number of offenses, uh, five, five offenses in total. Um, and it's, it's the first one of its kind um, in the UK. And going back to the flight log itself and where it's stored, um, not all systems have, um, uh, I'll say, the hidden, the secondary uh, you know, memory card within their device. Um, some do, some don't. Uh, but the ones that do, if a system does stray into an area that it shouldn't be and it crash, you know, the law enforcement now have the abilities to take that system pull off the flight card if there is one internally and then begin, be, begin doing their um, investigation um, whereas before you could have just said no, it wasn't me and there was no real evidence to kind of back that up um, so again another example I suppose if we've, we've spoken about this before more from the from the nerdy you're gonna crash your drone angle so you need um, you need good flight logging or you need to log your flight hours just for 
for safety management systems and things, day-to-day operations. Does it, does it come back that it would be a really good idea if there was a standard for this, an industry standard that everybody, let's not change it, it has to be like this. It does this, 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 and this. Yeah, sh- shaking heads. So no, I wonder who, who's going to push for that industry standard, I wonder. But that's a little bit aside. So we've got devices in our hands that can transmit data. Uh, to Facebook or to whatever social service you want to share your stuff on. Is it likely that um, that anything else, any other data is likely to disappear anywhere else? Would a, would a manufacturer want to have data to perhaps find out how well their aircraft work or something like that? Any thoughts on, on data going going away that people don't know is happening? So it's a good question. It's a good question you raised. Sorry, sorry, David. Um, no, go ahead. Clients ask us the same question. You know, when we are providing these services to our clients of consulting, some are flying sensitive areas. That they, you know, they want what you call a closed system. So, for example, the video only stays locally. It doesn't get broadcast onto the web. And then there are the smart systems, as we refer to them, that, you know, are intelligent enough to be connected to the internet at the same time whilst you're flying. Um, you know, and there are no guarantees around that. It's not like it's inside your IT infrastructure where you've got firewalls, and protection, etc., um, and that's one of the struggles that we face with our clients. But thankfully, we have a, a vast, you know, manufacturer relationship base and can cater for all. Um, but yeah, David, you were going. <laughs> I was essentially going yeah, to I, say what, what. Oh, go ahead, Kevin. I, I was going to mention. Uh, it's interesting because of how we started this conversation about how the Davids and what they do and their missions and how they're audited and um, their purpose, which is a very noble and and useful purpose. Um, We can talk about the commercial clients and we talked about uh, master service agreements and contracts that are established between a vendor and a client and the data constraints and how things should be handled and um, no disclosures, things like that. If the client is not aware of any distribution of that information, um, that's where this issue is. And that's, that's where it came from, my, my writing of the article and um, my exploration into this rabbit hole of what actually is being shared. Um, on my screen right now, you're actually looking at the, the SQL certificate. Basically, this is the tables and what is populated when files are uploaded to um, the manufacturer systems. Um, as you can see, it's extremely extensive. And that's really what we're talking about here is when people aren't aware of what's going on in the background, um, that's where the issues start. And if you're not aware of what is being collected and shared and it's not publicly disclosed, you can't get into an agreement with any clients that you can protect and show that and that's that's really what the issue is and you know the other option and the other thing i wanted the davids and the team to to talk about is yes their systems are designed to be vaults they are protected they're well designed and it shows exactly what needs to be done when it comes to the auditing and how they're protected what if someone came to david and said here's a million dollars we want to buy the information from you And that that system that they designed to keep others out, the door is opened and the floodgates are provided to those who have the money and the power to get the information from them. And that is what we're talking about when it comes to full disclosures of the systems, files, and what you've collected. When that is part of the agreement from day one, that your information, regardless of how it's stored, protected, and audited, will be free use for third parties what really can the user do? There are a couple options. Um, one is that thankfully there's a fairly vibrant market out there and we can encourage providers um, by essentially voting with our feet who are aligning their policies with the ways that we desire to protect or use our data. Um, there are some cloud service providers out there right now for doing mapping, for example. And most of them um, 
essentially say that once you upload your data to us, we can do whatever we want with it. You can vote with your feet. Um, there are ways of processing, there are ways of generating those maps by, uh, that you can bring in-house. Um, there are ways of processing that data that you can do in-house. Um, you can encourage other service providers who are in the same market by saying, hey, look, this other this service provider that we've been using won't protect our data efficiently or in the ways that we desire. Would you, if this other service provider, provide us with greater protections and we will demonstrate our appreciation for that by paying you a little bit more. We'll pay a premium for data privacy. Personally, I don't believe I should have to pay a premium, premium for data privacy, and this gets into Facebook and Google and a bunch of other things. But that, at the moment, yeah, that's the I, way I, the world's going. I, I, I agree with you, David, but I really don't believe that's reality. I, I don't think that that is the current state of things at the moment. I can bring I can bring it I can bring in all of my UAV operations in house, so I can definitely do that. Yeah, no, I know I know what you mean. Having the and then then I suppose that you know you'd say, well, that server's running this software and its job is to make maps. It's not connected to the internet. It's not whatever. Absolutely. It's not whatever. Nope. It's not this. It's not that. You know that's so. Then that makes that box a secure whatever it is, whatever job it's designed to do. Yeah, it, and, it, it, and, but not I, to be I, evil. That's the whole thing well, right there. And I not, agree. Yes, you well, can build your talking, system and keep it internal, but that's unrealistic when we're talking about the world. It's when we're talking about <laughs> well, users. Well, it's when we're talking about non-commercial entities and we're talking about small mom and pop entities. Those so the, but there's, uh, there's a risk those there's a risk there's a, there's a risk in that there's a risk analysis that people need to do. And you're doing a great job of informing people about the risks that they face by sharing their data in certain platforms. But we do risk analysis and risk management and risk mitigation in everything we do. So going out and driving, there's a certain risk that we accept when we go drive that we may get run into by somebody else. If you decide to use one of these software service platforms for mapping and you don't really care if somebody else is using your data, then you can go do it. And I well, think that for that's, many that's, people, I think that for many people, the battle. Exactly, and you're helping them solve that battle. I mean, it's in, if they're making an informed decision to put their data on a cloud service provider who has the rights, according to their EULA, to use their data in whatever way they want, if you're making an informed decision, that's, that's the way the world works. And let's, let's be clear, though. We're talking about this is where you have volunteered the data. You are sending something to be crunched somewhere, so you are very much part of that um conversation because you've instigated it what about what about if the yeah. system is sending data that you don't realize you that that it's sending what what if what if the system is doing something in the background that you don't know about where where are you where, where do you stand yeah there's two questions there isn't it do you think systems can do that and then do you, and we know that kevin thinks thinks they can and do and and what what does the the, the pilots, what responsibilities do they have then? What, what are they liable for? So liability gets interesting. Um, if you are unaware that a system is uploading critical data to, a, to a, another party and you're operating that system, um, I, not as a lawyer, would say you do not have uh, liability up until such a time as somebody writes an article saying, we can definitively demonstrate that this particular system is uploading data without your knowledge. And then at that point, you know, it's public knowledge and you as a responsible operator should be keeping up with the latest news about the platforms and tools you're using and applying the appropriate security measures. So if you keep flying past that point, then, and this is where I'm definitely not a lawyer, you should be more concerned. And the US government had exactly this problem uh, a couple of years ago, um, where they determined that certain products might be providing telemetry in ways that they were not necessarily comfortable with. And so they made an informed decision to uh, either lock down those platforms in a certain way so they couldn't communicate or to use other platforms until that problem was resolved. Yeah, it, it, you, you're correct there. I, I see that as something that any responsible commercial U.S. service provider in, in the United States, I'll keep it in the States here, guys, but um, if something was to come out, um, some sort of large-scale release from 
um, like the Davids or a company that's audited and controlled and third party saying this information is being shared without your knowledge, that that would definitely then fall on the users and the companies themselves to put in those um, abilities to stop that, control that, or just downright stop using the product. And that's where that whole you decide with your your feet and your money um, and how that, that next step happens. And if that were to happen, then that would have big impl implications for any one of those online service providers that crunch data into X, Y, and Z, because um, perhaps they have turned their business towards catering for um, particular manufacturers and platforms. And so if that, it's a double whammy then, isn't it? Because you, you, you'll have shared your data with them and they might be sharing it on anyway. And then, then we find out that, um, that uh, you know, that, that it's being shared in other ways with, with other people you didn't know about. What, what did so critical that, infrastructure, sorry, be, sorry, go on, after you. Yeah, so there are certain service providers which um, get access to the data that they want to use for flight management purposes that ask the user to upload the data to the vendor's platform and then they sync it down from the vendor's platform. So they are specifically requiring their users to synchronize their critical data with a vendor systems before it goes out to the end service provider, the one that you actually want to have processing your data. So it's not that you're sharing it with a service provider who's then sharing it on, it's going through somebody sure. else before it even gets to your service provider. And that, I have some issues with that particular model. I under, it's, it's efficiency, I understand why it's done. But you have, so you should look at all the possible ways your data is gonna flow. So if you're using a service provider for processing your images, and they are outsourcing that to somebody else, you want to understand that relationship and then ensure that that part of the logistical supply chain is also secure. And that's one of those fundamental truths about cybersecurity is that you are only as secure as your entire logistical supply chain is. So are some service providers then buying in that sort of, oh, I know, we'll bolt, bolt on a logging function so that people can, you know, look at their logs. Is that being bought in as a service I, through? I'm sorry, right there. There's many very widely used systems, and I'm, there's no reason to go into the specific names, but right there, second paragraph of user content, it says that by using their service, which is their IP and trademark, they have all rights and respects to your data. That's it, done. And that means that those files and what you upload and what is specified in that upload, which we just discussed earlier in the conversation, your telemetry, your dat file, all that information is then transferred to these third-party services, which then just claimed ownership. And they said, we'll do whatever we want, all rights and respects. So look, I've, just my, not a, a, I've, I've, I've just got my part there. 107. I've just bought some sort of multi-rotor or something. What do I do? Do I get to that first par the paragraph that says that, and then do I have a serious think and walk away? What do I do? You know, I'm a new user. I want to make money. Well, you know, that's a great that's a great way to, to introduce it, Gary. Uh, let's just talk about the the, the average of the forty thousand part 107s who more than likely come from a photography background. Photographers are great when it comes to ownership of captured images, right? For years, that is their domain. And if you want to even republish on your Facebook because they took an image of you and the family, you have to pay them for it, which they deserve, right? So now this photographer who's got 15 years in knows exactly how that works, buys a drone, um, wants to do some photography, but he wants to make it or she wants to make it um, you know, updated or, or show it in some sort of um, new way by using any of those systems because that's the way they would go since the money's right. You know, It's very inexpensive and you can produce amazing products with a lot of these uh, URL-based systems. I seriously doubt that if they read those full terms, they would agree. And that's only because any photographer that cares about their content, wants ownership of their content. But by agreeing and paying money to these services, use creating a login and then uploading any images, they just lost their ownership of that image. And there's so this, two of the biggest systems do that. So, so this goes back to my 
proposal that people look at UAV related services and UAV related cybersecurity using existing models. So a UAV is a flying pickup truck. Um, and for a photographer, a it's, it's a tool. It's, it's a tool, it's a flying pickup truck. It's carrying a sensor. And for critical infrastructure, maybe it's a methane detector. But for photographers carrying a high resolution camera, they don't need to use some new service to process video or images from a UAV. It's just a camera. If they've got 15 years in with a model that works for them for you know, cropping and for presenting and publishing their photographs, don't go use the very latest, greatest, sexy UA, uh, you know, web-based service that may not have the right controls on it. Use what's working for you until other people go off and on the bleeding edge and validate that that service does or does not do what it's supposed to do. Don't just get your UAV out and then buy into the whole UAV ecosystem. Take it a bite at a time, validate those bites at a time. And if you're a photographer, go fly it, download the cameras to your personal machine, use Photoshop, use whatever it happens to be that you've been using until you can validate these other tools. All right, let's, let's flip it around then. So now I'm not the 107 pilot. I am now the mega rich owner of ABC Electricity. What do I need to ask of the service providers that I'm going to use to do my line inspections? What do they need to prove to me uh, that they can do? They, well, there's a number of different things. So first of all, and we won't get into them all, but they need to be legal. Do they have the right, you know, permits and depending on what environment you're in, do they have processes and procedures for conducting their operations? You know, do they do annual inspections? Do, how do they do preventive maintenance? All that sort of stuff. From the purposes of this conversation that we're having, you want to ask them about their cybersecurity controls and particularly the cybersecurity controls they have wrapped around your data. So for example, at the end of a flight, well, let's start at the beginning of the flight. When they plan out the route, how are they protecting that data that defines your, the route? How are they protecting the access to that that somebody else could say, where are these people flying? They go collect that sensor data. They, it's sitting on the UAV and they're flying for a week all the way down your power lines. So they go back to the hotel at night and they leave the UAV in the trunk of their car because it's locked and their car gets broken into. So they want, you want to have them to have a data protection policy where at the end of the flight, as soon as it lands, they pull the SD card out and they copy that data onto a laptop. They validate that the copy was good. They make a backup and both the laptop and the backup are encrypted. Once they've confirmed that that data has been collected, backed up, encrypted, they wipe that SD card, they put it back in their collection they're using to fly. So now at the end of the flight, before they go to dinner, before they lock the UAV in the trunk of their car, they've secured your data. David, you and missed a step there. <laughs> Probably. <laughs> Just uh, that data is still on the black box on the bird. And that's what so, we were just talking about earlier. So you have to go in there, actually physically attach to the bird through your machine and wipe the data on that, and that, that file, flight logs that are actually on that black box as well to close that out. So you, yes, and that you, you touch on something that's very important. You need to look at all of your data, not just whatever data is coming from the sensor. And so then you, you also got out on your controller as well, I guess. Um, you need to look at all, this, this goes back to where we started the conversation. You need mm -hmm. to look at all the places where your data resides and apply the appropriate security controls to all those places, both at rest. So when it's sitting on your laptop, but if you then upload it to the cloud via an unsecure connection and you're doing it from a coffee shop and somebody else in the coffee shop can be sniffing that and pulling data off, then it doesn't matter how in well encrypted it is at rest. Um, before you wipe those onboard flight logs, though, you want to back up and preserve those as well. Because at some point, somebody's going to audit your flights. Did you really go fly what it was you were supposed to be doing? Or, you know, different type of scenario. Somebody says, oh, you were overflying my property, uh, spying on me. Uh, can you prove that you weren't? Well, we wiped the flight log, so we can't prove where we weren't or where we were. If you've got that information available, then you've established the data that you need to defend yourself against people saying you were doing something other than what you believe or what you stated you were doing. So this very nicely sort of lets me punt 
other David software really yeah. and all the other and all the other all the other companies that are standing up and doing this and I've said it before it's interesting the companies that are standing up with compliance software are standing up from countries that have had regulations for years and have I've said it last time and they've got to a point where oh we've got 10 10 UAS how on earth are we going to manage them all and it's all part of it and now if I am that new part 107 person or whatever around the world it would be really good news for me if I wanted to make critical infrastructure inspections to have that in my in my instead of my my website saying I do weddings, bar mitzvahs, and everything else. Every I inspect pipelines, anything that moves, as these websites do. It's you have a clear a clear data protection policy in place will set you apart from somebody that doesn't. It's quite a simple thing. And at least it means you've thought about it, I suppose. You've given it some consideration, which must must offer some protection for for, for other companies. Um, I'm sorry, I ranted a little bit there. Um, <laughs> what about, so that's, we've got a, we've got a business, we've got, a, we've got a, a, a 107 user. What about big, like, government entities? What about the Navy, the Army, the Air Force, or, or just... I, I suppose in America you must have a Ministry of Works or something that goes around and inspects bridges and things. Do they have policies for stuff like this? And uh, that's, that right there is is still in its infant stage. Uh, we work all the time with a lot of um, those entities: uh, Department of Transportation, state entities, federal. Um, that is something that their internal teams are just learning about, and they work with um, large companies like ours or others to help them navigate those situations and so, understanding okay. and education they have first. somebody is there a an office of sorting out whether this thing's secure or not somewhere in the u.s for the united states military absolutely they have their own internal systems and airworthiness and things like that that review all flight systems internal systems and they're auditing what is actually being done with the data that's collected with those sensors. That does exist. Okay, and then... And I've actually had experience, just to touch on that, um, I actually did uh, five um, aircraft hangar inspections using EIS, um, and it was on a live military, military site, um, and they're actually uh, reprepping these systems uh, to accept... Uh, vehicles back from Afghanistan uh, and they were going to recondition these sheds and these vehicles were going to go in. So I was on a live military site where they're actually doing live firing next to me and I was escorted by security personnel throughout my whole time on the site uh, saying this is your focal point, you can't shoot this way, you have to only focus on the shed areas. But then through the whole process from the point of flying, getting the data off the system, handing it over to them and releasing them, you know, but I think what people need to realize is as well, going back to touch on the flight log data, some flight logs contain imagery and they're embedded and encoded within a flight log. So when you hand over your data set, let's say, for that flight directly to the client on site, just bear in mind that still on the flight log, you could still have imagery embedded that can be deemed really sensitive. And again, it goes back to having that relationship with the manufacturer that's developed the system so you know exactly what that system is capable of and what you as an end user could expose you to. That's, I think, we'll jump, cool. we'll jump to the other Dave in a second. Are you telling me then on that little card that's inside, there might be imagery that I don't know about? Yes. Hmm. I, and that was, that, yeah. And that was, that was shown uh, when we did the, the video cache that's actually held on your one system and if that actually goes into the other. And, um, you know, there was other people's, uh, the other Kevin was one that actually um, would know more about that information. I wish he was here to share it, but yes. So, so other David, sorry, we, we've been we've been <laughs> jump, jumping all over other David. I'm, I'm sorry. Um, maybe you can elaborate on that a little bit. So there are two things I'll bring up, but to answer that specific question, for one of the major vendors out there, thumbnails of all the images you take during your flight are embedded in the log file that is on the mobile device itself. So that log file not only contains telemetry information, control information, things like that, it contains those thumbnails. And a lot of the flight management people, uh, vendors, uh, pull that data out as part of the service offering they're providing to you. Um, that data is currently not present 
on that vendor's onboard log files, but it's on that other SD card. So it, that's again an example of where you look for things. Going back to an earlier topic, you asked about whether there's a government entity that defines various controls for data protection, flight safety, and things like that. The military does do a lot of that. Corporations do some of that. But in the United States, there is no uniform data privacy law. And that's one of the big challenges facing uh, everybody out there, including law enforcement, search and rescue, fire, and things like that. Um, there is a national there's a federal entity that's responsible for flight safety and it's called the FAA. And one of the challenges that we're facing right now is that a whole bunch of people think that the FAA should have nothing to do with unmanned aircraft or at least small unmanned aircraft. And this is an example of where it's so the FAA is not, does not define privacy or data privacy. So that's not in, in their remit, but it's an example of where we may want federal oversight on some of these things. And one of the concerns I have right now is the FAA is looking like they're going to punt on 200 feet and below to local jurisdictions. Yeah. And if mm -hmm. they, if there's, there's reasons for punting some stuff down to local jurisdictions, but there's also some strong arguments for having a federal data privacy policy that applies not just to UAVs, but applies to everything relating to data and what happens if you lose it. There is some federal law and regulation around PII, personally identifying information. So if you lose somebody's social security number, certain things get triggered. But if you lose a picture of the backyard of their house, those same triggers don't exist. So, Yeah, no, I, I hear what you're saying about that. There, there is a bit of a cue to take over the airspace and monetize it. And yeah, we are a little bit un, uncertain of uh, what... Uh, what 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 might happen? You no, you're, you're bang on right, and I can see why the why well, they, well there is a a group of people that want want UAS especially SUS removed completely from the FAA's hands, um, and we do have to keep an eye on them. So let's just wind back that. So on the controller, there could be images and stuff that you aren't aware of, along with all the the flight logging and things like that, all the good stuff that happened. Now I suppose the critical thing about the flight controller is that's the bit that can talk to the internet. That's the bit that can talk to the world. The aircraft of, of itself cannot. Um, so I suppose if you wanted to communicate any information without people knowing, that's the place where you'd want to store the data that you need to communicate. I didn't say that very well, did you? I mean, th thoughts you on that? Said it very, that? So if you want to communicate information without the user's awareness, the best place to get access to that and most of the ecosystem is on that mobile device. And so you could have, particularly on Android phones, you could have a malicious application on there, which is either sort of in real time pulling telemetry and then moving that off someplace else, or it's getting access to files and moving it off someplace else. And so I could see somebody writing either a malicious app or malware of some sort that is targeting people's phones. And it's saying, okay, look for UAV related data. Has that happened yet? Probably not, but I don't say definitively not. Will it happen? We can't, we it, can't say that yet. <laughs> I'm, I'm not saying that yet, but what I'm saying is that the criminal, criminals and, and other malicious elements have found ways, if, if there's value in data on mobile devices, they ha and they, there's a way of monetizing it or otherwise deriving value from it, they know how to go get it. Um, there's yeah. existing toolkits that allow them to do that, and they would just shift the focus of that toolkit to pull other types of data. You could just make, look, here's the WYSIWYG simulator or the fantastic picturator machine or something that, that is of slight use to the, the end user and that sits on that Android device or whatever other device. And yeah, oh, yeah. because then if, if you've made that, um, oh, I've got to learn how to code. Um, <laughs> if, you've made that, if, if you've made that thing, then, um, then by people, you know, because it's the whatever Cyma, um, for the Cyma uh, quadcopter, you've already identified that you've got one because you've, you know, you're, you're self-identifying it and all that sort of thing, aren't you? Yeah, no. Well, right, look, just look at the, the look at the easier way to do that. And as David went over earlier on certain ways to protect that information, um, a lot of those tablets and a lot of people keep them with their drones. Um, you know, there people have moved from using their personal cell phones to smaller tablets. And, um, you know, there's certain manufacturer that's now 
um, providing the screen attached to the controller or detached where all that information will be available anyway. So the easier way to gather that is just to clip that tablet with the system and then you'd have access to all that um, extra information that's stored on it, the video cache, the audio cache, and all that other information that's already being collected. So instead of creating this uh, in just an ingenious exploit to capture that from a distance, you would just clip it. Oh, but, but I wanted something to do this weekend. Um, it's, yeah. Oh, well, there you go. Yeah. You and yeah. TM can code and, and, yeah. and work that out. I think um, I, I wanted to open up this can of worms because I, I started, I'm beginning to see more talk about security and things like that. And I think, because I'm just looking at the time, we've been talking for an hour already. We've been rambling on. And I've taken an hour of everybody's life here. I'm very sorry. Um, but there's a lot of noise going on about security. And it's definitely something that if you've got a, a drone business, you've got to think about. And you've got to, and because and, you've got to both protect yourself and your client. Um, and, you know, forewarned is forearmed. So just a little bit of thinking about it. And it, and I, again, I'm going to say, I think we need to push for a standard for 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 data transmission that will make safety management systems better and all, all the other good stuff um um moving forward and that's not well, I, I gary okay. you're absolutely right there is a huge uh push towards it um you know when we talk about this and we talk about well um what are the possibilities or what can happen next and and this becoming you know an issue of, of focus for different groups uh what if um certain groups just said it's too dangerous or there is an exploit so we just need to to, to stop flying them over certain things you know you can't fly them uh anywhere near military installations you can't fly them over certain critical infrastructures until we get this sorted you know that's that's always a possibility and what does that mean to the the global commercial uas world um the other one is if someone determines that this information is being sent without the user's knowledge what are the global uh, ramifications of that and really what are the next steps i just look at it in a sense of as soon as we publish things like this, and I saw that when I published my article, you get attacked. There's a lot of people that come at you saying that you're sensationalizing or you're creating a scenario that doesn't exist, or no, they don't do anything with your information. And you know they've talked about it before and things like that. I see well, that as just being naive. That's probably a sort of a semi, semi-valid argument. And you can probably, um, but 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 what you could do as an operator is just protect yourself and think about it and and make your decisions as the other david said make your decisions based on um consideration and as soon as anything comes out then obviously you change and i think if if there was a massive change um for several platforms one platform or dozens of platforms then then if you've thought about it you're obviously in a position to dodge <laughs> and that's what if for your business you just need to be proactive don't you You don't just need to keep rolling along um i don't think that the industry would would fall down around everybody's ears it just means some people might have thought about it and they'll have put themselves ahead ahead of any any roadblocks what's it they say in not the apprentice, is it? It's that other thing where they race around the world. What's that? That guy from CDR raced around the world, didn't he? They're roadblocks and things, and they. So um, yeah, whatever. They'll, they'll have moved their way out of the roadblocks. But look, I am rambling on, um, and we've all been here an hour, and it's Friday night, so I can have a beer now. That's after five o'clock as well. Perfect. It's like five o'clock somewhere, and somewhere in the empire. It is. It's always. It's always. Gary. You you enjoy yourself out there. I, I again, I just want to say, and I, I said it before that. Um, you and your team over there having this platform and, and getting people like the Davids and myself together and, and being able to, to talk openly and, you know, uh, put information out there is great. And I appreciate it. Thank you very much for that. Um, I, I wish that it would be more um, accepted or more uh, taken seriously, because other than the good news that you share, um, these are concerns that should be discussed and uh, it should be more of an open forum and, and not just um, as we've seen recently with the, the political entities and people talking tech and all these um, uh, vested interest companies, it should be all the way down to the, the part 107, you know, um, drone users and the clients that leverage and consume the data that's being collected. Well, the industry is growing up, isn't it? And, and people like the Davids, the grown ups of the world, have, have foreseen issues and problems and have got solutions 
to help solve them. And uh, it's just the word needs to get out amongst it. Only at the end of the day, we're just talking about America, only 50,000 or so people that have got are in a position with a 107 to actually use it. But anyway, that's another story. So, it, it's, um, it's, David, if you've got. It's, it's also uh, the about the day, sorry. 3 million users. What about the 3 million users out there that aren't part 107s or in the US? And, you know, that's really the, the big bulk here, isn't it? Uh, I don't know. I don't know. Anyway, look, it's beer, it's beer o'clock. Gentlemen, beer thank o'clock. you very, very much. I'm going to go away and think about this some more. And if anything develops in the next couple of weeks, I think we should reconvene and talk about um, drone data security once more. Um, if you haven't, so we normally uh, do this at 2100 GMT on a Tuesday. Um, we have Bruce Simpson and various other people come along. But this is a little bit of a special because I think security is this week seems to be bubbling into a hot topic. So I think we should all keep our eyes on the news and see what's happening. Um, subscribe at the bottom. Have a great weekend, everybody. Um, bad luck of you seeing this on Monday. The week will be over. <laughs> and we'll, um, we'll reconvene again. Thanks, everybody. Cheerio. Thank you very much. Cheers. Thanks for coming. Bye.